it's an honor to get to be here with all of you. I've had so many memories from uh, coming to Pepperdine year after year for so long, and it's, it's a joy to get to come with my family and start to make some of those memories, even with my son, who Mike mentioned. You know, it's crazy how the time flies. It, it feels like just yesterday that he was at that stage where he was crawling all the time. It just didn't matter where you would put him. He would begin to crawl. And uh, here's, here's video proof of concept from, uh, from that back in that day with my son Finn, where he was at this place where basically wherever you'd put him down, he'd crawl to you. You could put him on the wood floors and he would crawl to you. You could, you could put him on carpet and he'd crawl to you. You could take him outside and he'd crawl to you. Put him on tile in the kitchen and he would crawl to you. But one day I set him on grass. Uh, this poor kid had no idea what to do. This is minutes of our life cut into just a few seconds as we laughed and laughed and then finally, like me and my wife Courtney, we had to get down close to him and begin to coax him and get him and then very slowly but surely he began to lean forward and crawl in the grass. Now, I show you that because number one, it is objectively adorable. And number two, because it's a really good picture of my journey with 2 Samuel 23. <laughs> See, the first time that I started looking at it, like it, it just, I felt like a kid on grass. And it, it, it took some discomfort and some coaxing from the Lord and my cope to get me to move in this section of Scripture. But the more time I've spent with these mighty men the more I believe that there's something sacred to be learned in the trenches of this text, even from the introduction. So if you've got your Bibles, you're welcome to turn over to 2 Samuel 23. I'm going to be, begin at the very beginning of verse 8. These are the names of David's mighty warriors. Lest we define David the soldier only by his individual Heroism, 2 Samuel makes sure we understand something very important. David had moments where he stood alone, but a lifetime of standing among. Among brothers in arms, among friends and allies, among these mighty men. You know, for me, this text has been a reminder that leadership isn't just marked by what you accomplish, but by the team you assemble. Legacy isn't just what you did, it's who you led. Because every captain needs a crew, every coach needs a team, every list needs a third thing. But seriously, <laughs> just think, think for a second about other leaders in scripture. I mean, you've, you've, got, you've got Moses and, and then you've got, you've got right there with him, Aaron and Miriam and Joshua. You've got, you've got Paul, but Paul, even though there's moments where he's alone for so much of his life, you've got Barnabas, you've got Timothy, you've got John Mark, you've got Lydia, you've got Priscilla, you've got Aquila. I mean, okay. Even John the Baptist had followers, and that dude ate bugs, okay? Like, we're not meant to do this life alone. We're not meant to journey and follow Jesus alone. But, but for a moment, for whoever's listening in, in person or online, go, go beyond the scriptures. I mean, you, you pick up the biography of any great leader or achiever in history, and it's not going to take many pages before you're going to find the name of a coach, of a point person, of a spouse, of a mentor, the business partners, the teammates, the loyal friends who contributed to that leader's work. Leaders just don't live in a vacuum. We are meant to read these names and stories from this vantage point. Their names, however difficult to pronounce, are written in this book not just because they were mighty men, but because they were David's mighty men. They are affirmed and included because of their affiliation with the king. Oh, that, that's, that's a one-sentence sermon right there. Like, we, we, could, we could camp out and just live in that gospel truth right there. And I know we could because I'm a preacher's kid, and I've seen my dad camp out and do something like that lots of times. But I also know my last name, and so if we're going to make it to lunch, i got to keep moving. So, <laughs> so what of... I love you, Dad. So what of these... Mighty men. Well, the record of David's men begins with a trio called the Three. I'm an NBA fan. Every good team needs a big three. Here they are. We have Josheb Bashabeth. Thanks again, Mike, for these names. Uh, Attackmanite was chief of the three. 
He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai, the Ahite. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Paz Damim for battle. When the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. I actually read about historical accounts of this kind of thing happening in battle outside of Scripture, even in recent centuries. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. <laughs> Next to him was Shammah, son of Agi, the Hararite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down. And the Lord brought about a great victory. Now, among the startling number of dead Philistine soldiers and heroic accounts, there's, there's a couple of well-worn leadership principles on display even among these three. And since we're doing this in relationship to David and his mighty men, that's really the vantage point I want to take as we look at these men of, of these, these lessons we can learn. Now, the first principle is less useful for us, but it is very important and worth noting. And the first is this. Talent draws talent. I didn't say I was going to make a spiritual point first. I'm just saying talent draws talent. David was a great warrior. He, according to the local songs, had killed his tens of thousands. Now, I'm not saying that that was like at one time uh, like JB here, but still, you get the point. His exploits drew men who themselves were fierce warriors. The best want to operate and work alongside the best. Now, several years ago, I learned this principle the hard way, and uh, that talent draws talent. I learned it the hard way when I, uh, I started as a worship leader, uh, and I, I was helping my home church in North Carolina uh, transition and add an instrumental service to their weekend. And, uh, and, and I learned very quickly uh, this principle was working against me because I was an inexperienced worship leader, didn't know what I was doing the first time for me to do that. And then, and then my volunteers, they were great people. They loved the Lord, but you know some of them were still even learning the instruments they were trying to play. And so I remember talking to a, a worship leader friend and going, what? What do, I, what do I have to do to try and get more people to want to join in? And he was like, oh, it's really simple. Get better. <laughs> like I said, not necessarily as useful for us, but it's a fact of life and it's worth noting. The second principle is, I think, far more useful and letting it kind of weigh on us. Followers imitate what leaders model. See, it's, it's no accident when we look at these stories of even, even the, the big three that there's our stories of this individual courage and heroism, this bravery. Now, were these men in their own right great warriors? Absolutely. Do they have an interest, perhaps selfishly, for, to serve with the king and, and get that kind of acclaim? For sure. And yet, here, even, even with two of these, Eleazar and Shammah, we have stories of those who, when others retreated in fear, they stood their ground. And reading this, as these being David's mighty men, I can't help but think about David and what Chris Smith talked to us about with David and Goliath and standing his ground. David had modeled that take a stand kind of courage for them. And by the way, in 1 Samuel 17, David is sure to make mention that it's the Lord who's sovereign over the battle who will deliver into the hands. And I don't think it's any accident that as the narrator tells us these stories about Eleazar and Shammah that he is quick to point out that the Lord brought about a great victory. See, it's not, it's not just that David modeled this kind of courage on the battlefield. It's that he modeled a faith of who, understanding who's sovereign over the battle. See, followers, they, they imitate what leaders model. Here's a phrase we use at my church a lot. We're shaped by what we see. So a question to let land on our toes is what, what are people seeing in us? as leaders, as spouses, as teammates, as employees, as coaches, as mentors, as friends. What are they seeing in us? But 
I wish we could just camp out there, because we could. And yet, we've got to keep moving, because I want to I make sure we don't miss some of the other lessons that are right here for us. Because really, there's the big three, and yet, before we get to the longer list of names, I promise I will spare you reading all of them and mispronouncing and botching all of their names. Uh, there are a couple of honorable mentions before we get to the longer list list of the mighty men, the 30. Before that, we get a couple of honorable mentions, and even in those, we begin to see a little bit of uh, kind of some editorializing, sports center style of who belonged where in the rank, because you've got the big three, and then you've got the 30, but somewhere in the middle, there's some other greats, some other, maybe uh, if you're a basketball fan, Allen Iverson types, who, you know, they're not at the summit, but man, they're awesome. And, and so in these References, we've got Abishai, the brother of Joab, and, and we've heard a little bit about him even this week, who was ready to smote Saul with just one smote. And, uh, and then we've got, if, yeah, if you heard David Fleer, you heard that one, it was great. Uh, then we've got Benaiah. And Benaiah teaches us a pretty important principle, because it's not just that followers will imitate what leaders model, it's that the best kind of leaders help their followers and raise them up to even surpass them. So, so Benaiah and David, they've got a, a, a one particular story that has some similarities. So David was a shepherd boy, and he tells Saul that there were occasions where he would, he would go after a bear or a lion. And he and Benaiah, David and Benaiah, both have stories about lions. David would go after the lion, and he would kill it and, and save the sheep as he was a shepherd boy. Which, I mean, that's, that's pretty intense. That's awesome. But, but Benaiah, verse 20 tells us that Benaiah once went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. Boom, mic drop. <laughs> Here's the thing. We don't even know why this happened. We are given no other details. The sentence just sits there in pure, out-of-context awesomeness. He went down into a pit on a snowy day and he killed a lion. Way to go, Beniah. A couple verses later, we find out that David, David hired Benaiah to be captain to lead the bodyguard, his own kingly guard. And I like to think that like that lion story was what got him the job. You know, like they're they're doing all these different, you know, looking at the resumes and they're doing the personnel search, searching the headhunters, and then all of a sudden they bring Benaiah's resume and David's like, "What's this guy know for?" Oh, he went into a pit on a snowy day and he killed a lion. Okay, stop searching, just offer him the job. I don't even want to do an interview. I want that guy. I want the lion in a pit on a snowy day guy because if the Philistines ever come up with lion assassins, I'm gonna know I'm safe. Like that's what I need. I need that guy. Okay, we're we're, we're having a little fun with it, but. But listen close. In David's eyes, Benaiah's achievements weren't cause for competition. They were cause for a promotion. Can we just wrestle with that for a second? I know we got lots of different people listening, but just for a moment, for, for those of you who, who lead in this room, and I would imagine that's a lot of you. Maybe you're not necessarily on an org chart, but there is some setting in which you are a leader, whether it's your home or team or a club, at church, your job, let's just wrestle with this for a second. Are, are you intimidated when an employee surpasses you in your area of expertise? Somebody you helped hire and train up? Or do you confidently celebrate, support, and promote the people around you? You know, 10 years ago this month, I started an internship at a church in Kentucky called Southeast Christian Church. I learned a lot of leadership lessons while I was there. It was a full year internship. And, uh, and one of my favorite stories that, I, uh, from, that I, I learned while I was there was about the earliest years for Southeast. They were a pretty small congregation in the 1960s. They'd only been around for about four years at the time. And they were looking for a new preacher. And as they prayed and as they searched, this is what the elders of Southeast Christian Church began to tell people as they began to search. We want to find a young man with a good heart who loves Jesus, and we want to make him successful. It's a fascinating angle to take on a hiring process. We are seeking to make someone thrive for the sake of the kingdom. Now, there's, there's more to the story for Southeast, but they ended up, the short version is they ended up hiring a man named Bob Russell, who preached at Southeast for 40 years as the church grew from a few hundred to well over 15,000 by the time he retired. As I said, there's more to the story and God's favor 
and God's glory. But, but think for a moment about a career of 40 years in which you were hired by a group of people who love Jesus and yet they're the kind of leaders who say, we want to help someone thrive and succeed and lead for the sake of the kingdom. Great leaders are great, not just because of what they accomplish on their own, but because of what they empower others to accomplish. So just allow me this question. Are Benayas empowered in your sphere of influence? At your church, on your team or your staff, are they being raised up? Or as they show some level of gifting, is, is it that we're threatened? Or as they assert some level of influence, is it that, that we begin to territorialize? Or do we see some of those kind of leaders and say, we have got to give them a place? I mean, Benaiah doesn't get one of the, he, gets, he, he doesn't get one of the spots among the big three. Somehow in David's kingdom, there was room for, other, for many people to thrive as leaders, for many people to thrive, for many people to grow, for the sake of his kingdom. Man, I, I love the heritage that I have in churches. And at the same time, there's part of me that when I look at this, I think, oh man, how many Benayas have inadvertently been stifled or kicked to the curb because of pride, because of inner struggles, because of uh, a lack of unity or misunderstanding. I mean, uh, my prayer for the church globally was that we would, we would choose... A, to see again, not just here, but even in Paul's words in Ephesians, that we are to be those who equip the saints for ministry. For the church leaders listening to me, for the ministers listening to me, for the elders, for the deacons listening to me, please, we cannot just be doers. We have to raise up the Benayas. We have to empower them. We have to give them a place because the kingdom is better for it. Amen. And it's okay if they have a lion story that's better than ours. And it's okay if they stand on our shoulders and do something more than we were able to do before. That will not be our demise. That will be our glory in God's kingdom. Amen. It's the mark of great leaders. But I understand that it is so easy for me, in my early 30s, to just sit here and talk about what great leaders do. And yet with 10 years of ministry, I know that being a great leader is not always great. That there are times... And sometimes not just times, but years and wounds and scars because leadership is demanding. And as we've seen this week in David's life, leadership brings out, can bring out the worst in us. And I wish, I, I wish that we could be spared of that here just with the mighty men. And yet the narrator doesn't even allow us that. You'd think that among the war stories and a list of names, David would be safe, but no. And it's actually among the names. The very last in the chapter lands with a thud. Of the 30, there is named Uriah the Hittite. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're at the retrospective of his reign and rule, and there it is still. And we won't retread, but it's, it's enough to say this. David's dishonorable murder cannot erase Uriah's honorable service. So there he is, closing out the chapter before there's a transition. But that's not how I want to close this message. I, I don't want to finish with a particular name. I actually want to finish with a story of, of some unnamed mighty men. Some scholars say that this story starting in verse 13 is the three, and others debate and say, no, it's just one of the 30, and the point, the point of the story does not hinge on us knowing their names. I'm going to begin in verse 13. During harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of Adullam while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. Now, many scholars speculate that this is probably early in David's reign as king because new kings are vulnerable kings. New, new kings, they, they have to prove themselves or they buckle under the pressure and another king or kingdom comes in to take over. So we have this particularly brazen attack by the Philistines and they're in deep in Israelite territory and 
David, in the midst of all of this, has a moment that every leader has. A moment where it's just one of those days. where it, Maybe, maybe it, was, it was Easter Sunday and you thought things were going good and then all of a sudden across the morning this, all these different things went wrong. And the last conversation you had before heading out to the parking lot on a day that should have been so great was somebody complaining. Somebody mouthing off. Seeing a guest get away before you're able to speak to them. I don't know. But one of those leadership moments that just goes, man, I feel like a failure. After all, I mean, <laughs> what kind of a king can't even protect his hometown? Did you hear that? That it's Bethlehem that's become not just, it's not just been run over, but it is the garrison. The enemy has made a home in David's hometown. It's a bad place to be as a king. And so this is a crisis of confidence as much as it is like, oh man, I could use a drink right now. This isn't just about water. They're at a stronghold. There's other water available. The issue is something deeper. And David says this in kind of a wouldn't it be nice kind of a way, out loud, but not necessarily to anyone in particular. But three of the mighty men, they, they hear him. And then I, I like to think that, you know, they, they kind of start to dare each other. Like, hey, what if, what if we went? One of them grabs an empty goat skin. All right, let's do this. They leave the cave, kind of slink out the back and make their way. And it's very possible that some of the men listed here in 2 Samuel 23 were the kind of people who were, they were like stealthy assassins. I mean, we, we got that story of, you know, Abishai uh, with David like, slinking into Saul's camp. I mean, so, so some of these guys, they were stealthy and they were quiet and they had tactical skill, but not these dudes, okay? <laughs> look, look at what happens. So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. Okay, that sentence took us on a marathon-length trip from Adullam to Bethlehem and back. The writer makes it happen so quick, it's hard to appreciate how insane and frantic this all would have been. They say that they break through the enemy lines. This is like that moment in those action-adventure movies where, like, they're done sneaking around and they just go through the front door, guns blazing. Like, this is that kind of a, you know, Matrix kind of moment. And <laughs> so then once they get through, they get to the well. The well is right by the city where all of the other soldiers are camped out. And so they're presumably fighting them off, two of them, while one of them is drawing water and putting it in a goat skin. And then as quickly and chaotically as they showed up, they take off. But just, just for a moment, like, indulge me. Can, can you imagine being a Philistine corporal having to give that report to a general? Like, you know, everything breaks loose and then you get called in. Tell me what happened, son. Sir, uh, some Israelite soldiers were, were here, and well, they, they, uh, they broke through our ranks, and uh, they, they came towards the, the garrison at, at Bethlehem. Well, with all those soldiers, they must have been overwhelmed. Well, not, not exactly, because, um, you know, they, they didn't come inside. They didn't come inside. No, no, they, uh, they just they wanted some water. <laughs> what? Yeah, they, they, uh, one of them got water out of the well. Is that it? Well, I mean, they killed a bunch of guys, and, and then they left. Like, can you imagine how demoralizing it would be? You, you're the Philistines, and three soldiers have broken in just to basically do the army version of pantsing you. <laughs> just to come to the well and get some water, and then they go back. But, but like, that, that embarrassment for the Philistines, that's just the icing, because the cake was always to take it back to David. And they carry it back, and, and they're bloody, and they're sweaty, they're breathing heavy, and, and they hold out this goat skin. Here you go. And David, I imagine it takes him a moment to realize what in the world has just taken place. I mean, he, he's got this skin of water, and you're saying this is from, this is from Bethlehem? Where, where all the Philistines are, like tons of them? Well, I mean, less now, but yeah. <laughs> And then, for David, this is just too much. He's overwhelmed. Look at, look at what happens. But David refused to drink it. 
hold on, this is, this is what we brought this to you for. Like all of that. And David refused to drink it. And yet what he does with it is far more sacred, far more lasting. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this, he said. Is not the blood of men who went at the risk, is not, is not this the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. David's men show us what great devotion looks like. But David shows us who that great devotion belongs to. See, he humbly perceived, and I think back to that thesis that Randy had Tuesday night, that David's at his best in his humility. He humbly perceived that devotion to the Lord's anointed was really devotion to the Lord. And for the mighty man of the old covenant, sometimes that was a hard line to walk. But for you and I, it's not so. The Lord's anointed for us is in fact the Lord himself. He's worthy to receive our lives, like the Apostle Paul who says, who says to Timothy, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering before the Lord. Our anointed is worth the sweat, the grind, the courage, the honor, that to hear even a wisp of his desire would send us on mission. But we have better news than that. It's not just that he's worthy of our sacrifice. It's that Jesus became the offering for us first. He's the one who provides living water. He's the one who came to Bethlehem, not from a cave, but from heaven, to then be poured out in our time of need, to lift us and raise our spirits and in his kingdom, mighty men and women are marked by how they are transformed by their king from the inside out to imitate him and pour out their lives. Because in the kingdom of the son of David, mighty men and women don't take the lives of others. Instead, they lay down their own. In the kingdom of the prince of peace, mighty men don't fight their enemies. They love them. In the kingdom of our mighty God, blessing is spoken not over those who wage war, but over those who make peace. In the kingdom of the king of kings, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In the kingdom of the son of David, mighty men and mighty women know the upside down truth that David experienced in this moment of weakness. We know his grace is sufficient for us. And that when we are weak, then we are strong. My prayer is that God continues to lead us. He is the one, Isaiah's prophecy says, he's the mighty God. And so we follow him by his spirit turned into mighty men and women who serve and who lead and who sacrifice and who raise up others and give them a place to thrive in the kingdom for the sake of the king, who because of our affiliation with him has put our names in his book of life. I'm going to invite the team back up and pray over you, and we're going to pour ourselves out in worship with one more song. God, I thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for being the mighty man in Christ that we needed. The perfect offering and sacrifice poured out for us. The one who shows us what real courage and bravery and devotion looks like. Lead us by your spirit to receive again the gift and to pour it back out. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.